Hi, I'm Jennifer Howard and I've been the member for Ipswich since 2015. During that time, I've delivered record funding for health, education and housing, and we've seen a dramatic drop in unemployment. I'm proud to be a part of the Miles Labor government, who've provided a nation-leading cost of living package. I'm asking for your support to be re-elected at the upcoming election on the 26th of October. There's more to be done, and with your help, I will keep doing what matters for Ipswich. Authorised Kate Flanders, 16 Peel Street, South Brisbane. Coming up, it's episode 400 of the show. And if you grew up in Ipswich and Brisbane in the 60s, 70s and 80s, there's plenty to reminisce about with my special guest, Brett Debritz. He worked in Ipswich not once, but twice at the Queensland Times, and the shared experiences with the capital will bring back a lot of memories. Plus, at the end of the show, I'll ask Brett to make three bold predictions. It's Monday, October 7, 2024, and I'm Alan Roebuck. Welcome to Ipswich Today, which acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land on which it is produced and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. This podcast is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. This is episode 400 of Ipswich Today, and for the milestone, my special guest is Brett Debritz, who among many career highlights is the author of the Mr Brisbane blog. He is no stranger to Ipswich, having worked at the Queensland Times not once but twice, starting in the 1980s. He's an all-round writer, editor, blogger, broadcaster, and cultural commentator. Thank you for joining Ipswich Today, Brett. It's my pleasure. Good to talk to you again. It's been a while. It has been a while. And I want to begin this episode with a content warning. There may be a healthy dose of self-indulgence in this episode. Maybe two healthy doses of it. (laughs) It Maybe. If I get a chance. (laughs) It was one of your recent Mr. Brisbane blogs about growing up in Brisbane in the 60s and 70s that actually prompted me to contact you because I think everyone of our era or surrounding eras would have similar memories what are the ones that really stay with you what's the old saying you know the uh, the path of a different country and it really really was i mean my childhood um was so different to the things that we ex- that, that we experience now and we expect now of our own lives well and i hate to say it was a more innocent time i don't think it was it, i i you know there was crime and there was and and there were things I guess that we were sheltered from because it wasn't pushed into our face all the time. But I guess it is true that kids tended to have a uh, more of a free reign because nowadays whether that, that's not possible or whether parents just think it's not possible to do to allow kids to, to go and experience life. But, yeah, I, I you know, Brisbane, they used to call it the big country town and there was this idea that, that, that it was nothing uh, under, uh, under Joe Bjorki Peterson or whatever. It was a sort of rural uh, place and then suddenly it exploded with the Commonwealth Games and Expo and all that sort of thing. Uh, and I don't know no, that's true. I think it's, it was just evolution. But it's certainly the, the things that we had in the childhood that I miss are the, you know, uh, are the, the, the cliched ones, the corner store and the, you know, and the, playing cricket in the street, which I do not recommend. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> no. uh, yeah, I mean, the innocence of, of, of childhood, I think it still does exist because I see kids today, I've got a grandchild, and I, you know, the world is is full of wonder. And the problem, of course, is as we get older, we, we, we probably tend to, to lose that sense of wonder. We become more cynical. Uh, we can't become more worried about where we're going to, where we're going to earn our next dollar and, uh, you know, how we're going to pay for this, how we're going to pay for that rather than going out there. And I think that fueled my adventure in later life uh, of, of wanting to travel and still wanting to do that and going to see things. So I do a blog called Mr. Brisbane, but I, I do intend to spend uh, time outside, but not, not great, great long periods as I have in the past. I, I, I've decided, I've made a decision but this is where I'm going to stay. This will be my forever home, which well, is not a decision I would have made five years ago. Ah, interesting. Um, yeah, so I'm going to, in fact, I'm making arrangements at the moment to move into, for the. I think it's the 25th move I'm going to make in my life. 
Uh, well, 25th different place. Yeah. If you count the number of times I went back to mum and dad's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's probably in the 30s. I love when you were talking about Brisbane there, a big country town. Yes, it did have that badge. And when I think back, what I was allowed to do was a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old, you know, I was living at Petrie and I was allowed to jump on the train on my own, go into Brisbane, go to the cinema on my own, get back on the train and go back home. I, yeah. I, I don't think parents would allow that today. No, they'd have conniptions at the very thought of it. Mm. And, 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 and again, I don't know, is it too dangerous for that to happen or is it just that we perceive that it's more dangerous? That, that, that we're coddling kids a bit more than we need to. But I guess nobody wants to be that parent who's made the bad decision, do they? No, absolutely. And the driving to school thing today gets me. Why, do, why is nearly every kid driven to school? <laughs> if, if, if my sister's <laughs> listening to this, she's going to say, it would be a hypocrite that you were driven to school and I was. <laughs> uh, the way my family worked was... Uh, my dad was quite a bit older than my mum and my sisters were old, were nine and 11 years older than me. So this is a running joke in my family was that I was the one who was uh, molly coddled a bit and my dad <laughs> had retired by the time that I was uh, in high school so he used to give me a lift to school. <laughs> uh, let's go back so to... I can't help you there, Alan. No, no that's all right. That's, I'm, I'm on my own by the sound of it. But let's go back to your blog and you were talking about radio and you mentioned one in particular who was uh, Russ Walkington on 4BH, Russ late 60s, mm. early 70s with his character Gerald the Grasshopper. Now just to, yeah, to the give grass. you... Yeah, just to give you a feel of um, what 4, 4BH was the top 40 station there for a good while and they had mm. this great package of jingles and I was a very early lover even as a 9 or 10 year old of jingles let's enjoy this more super oldies radio for the Now, Brett, that has to take you back. It does, yeah. Mentioning Gerald the Grasshopper, I saw Russ um, at Brookside Shopping Centre in Mitchelton. Uh, he was doing a sort of a show and they were promoting some product or whatever and we all went along there. And I met him uh, again uh, maybe 10 years ago at, at a function and had the pleasure of sitting next to him and he was still involved uh, with uh, Community Station 101 FM, I think. And uh, Russ, uh, yeah, I remember then switching to listening to 4BK with Wayne Roberts, and Wayne was edgier. Wayne, Wayne was, um, uh, and, I, and I was thinking about this in the context of Carl Sanderlands, you know, who's under fire for being crude, rude, and I'm wondering, because Wayne Pooh, as he used to call himself, um, probably uh, popped criticism about some of his, uh, some of his hand. he used to uh, employ his uh, listeners to rip your cheeks apart. Mm. Mm. People thought that you know back in the back in the late sixties, early seventies, it was a bit a bit raunchy. Well, and of yeah. course, Russ uh, was Russ the, was sort of the uh, late sixties, early seventies, and and Wayne came yes. along late seventies, basically. Yeah, well, that's it. And then, so I was in high school. I was listening to to Wayne Roberts in in primary school. I was listening to to Russ, and also four um, BC used to be on a lot in my household because my dad um, was a big fan of Hayden Sarge and Greg Carey on the talk back and also a fan of the races. So we'd be listening to Vince Curry and, and uh, that was his thing. Uh, he was only a small punter, but he, but he just, that was, that was what he did. His entertainment. My mum used to say, you don't drink, you don't smoke, you got to do something. <laughs> uh, so it was a, you know, a dollar each way on the uh, rain lover or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a Melbourne cup win there somewhere. In between Russ and Wayney for me, because I ended up working at 4BK as well, doing the Midnight to Dawn show before Wayne, but that's another story. But uh, in between that, 4IP was, was the powerhouse. So as, as 4BH dropped the hits, 
four IP really rocketed to mm-hmm. fame. So I'll I'll do this in chronological the good order. Guys. Yeah, yeah the, the good guys. So here's a few of those good guys. Colorful four IP, all of the good guys. Jeff Marlin, Peter Rudd, David Greenwood, Grant Coleman, Billy J. Smith Jr. And again, what a, an A-class roll call of personalities for the era. Lee J, again, someone who I met later in life and sadly passed away a few years ago. Uh, yeah, he, he, was, he, he was the man and he called the rugby league too. He was, I think he, he used to go, but was it the teenage heartthrob or something oh, like that? Was did, it, uh, was, t- teenage idol, perhaps? Something, something like, that. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I do remember, and I also remember from that era, um, uh, for IP, I got, I got a feeling that Wayne Roberts was on IP for a little while. I think he um, was, and and also uh, Alan McGurvin, and then later uh, for IP transitioned to Radio Ten and then to Stereo Ten, and that period was when I was first working at the Queensland Times, and that was a big story because even though for IP and the IP is obviously Ipswich uh, had moved from Ipswich to Brisbane a long time before that. That was cutting the last ties, and a lot of people, including uh, Councillor Tully, uh, Paul Tully, uh, were very vocal about this at the time. You know, just thought, well, okay, you, 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 you just that's it. You know, you don't want anything to do with Ipswich anymore. Which I think I think it was a pragmatic decision on their part, but uh, it was also a bit doomed to failure because FM was uh, knocking on the door uh, at that point. Yes, it was. 1980 was that uh, was that turning point. Uh, but you mentioned Wayne Roberts and ripping cheeks apart, which was very cheeky in the day. So look, a- another excuse for a jingle. Who's going to keep you warm this winter? Who's going to win your heart? Who's going to keep you nice and cosy and rip your cheeks apart? Wayne Roberts that's you. Ah uh, yes, memories of Wayne Roberts, and yes, very, and that very was tame. Wayne himself, I think, singing, yeah, it and was. he had a, a brief top career under the name Click Zimmerman from that, memory. That's right. Some people may remember that. Tell me about your leap from school to print journalism. Uh, yeah, well, when I left school, I, I got pretty good marks, and as you could back then, um, thanks to the uh, to uh, changes at a federal level, uh, working class kids like me could go to could go university. So I went to university. I was going to be a teacher. I was going to teach history and English. And I, as you do when you're putting together a degree, you've got to pick a few subjects. I thought, oh, journalism sounds interesting. And that overtook my interest in the other two areas. And teach by the time of third year, I had enrolled in the teaching uh, uh, diploma course. But my journalism lecturer had organised a job for me. So um, I got a job in Toowoomba. So the, the pathway was to Umba, to Ipswich, and then into Brisbane uh, in the early 80s. How many newspapers have you worked at in the Brisbane and Ipswich region? Well, I worked in most of them. Some of them may be harder than others. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. I, uh, yeah. uh, old joke. <laughs> uh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, major titles are good, uh, a good number. Yeah. Uh, we'd be looking just, just off the top of my head. From Toowoomba, where I worked at the uh, the Queensland Grangara on the Western Star and the Gatton Star, to the Queensland Times, to the Daily Sun in Brisbane. Little brief uh, interruption there. I went to Rockhampton. I went to Sydney. Worked at the Daily Mirror. Back to Brisbane. Then overseas. Then back to Brisbane. The Sunday ma- the Sunday Sun after the Daily Sun closed. Then the Sunday Telegraph. They had a Brisbane bureau for about eighteen months. Back overseas to Hong Kong. <laughs> then back. Uh, Back to Brisbane, back to the QT for the second time in the um, in the late 1999, 2000. Uh, then got headhunted back uh, to the Sunday Mail where I was for, for about eight years. Then overseas again and back in where I worked for newspapers in um, uh, Scotland, in Thailand, and for five years in the United Arab Emirates. Wow, that's, uh, that's untravel. Yeah. Um, and, and, <laughs> and then then back here. Uh, for family reasons, about uh, four years ago, and uh, and then of course I, you know, I arrived just before the pandemic, and 
that's, I think, where a lot of people made decisions about what they were going to do. And my decision was that, well, Brisbane's the forever home. So cranked up Mr. Brisbane as the uh, as the blog, and uh, I'm, I'm doing some part-time work, which is not media associated at the moment, but mm. I did spend uh, a year and a bit uh, producing it for BC with Spencer House, and so reigniting that radio connection. We'll come to 4BC a bit later in our chat, but you arrived at the QT first time in 81, I think it was. Describe Ipswich yes. back then. What was it like? It was a... Um, I guess a quiet place it was. It seemed from a, from a, a brizzo as I was. It seemed you know a bit, a bit remote. But I, I mean, be, bearing in mind that I'd spent time in Toowoomba and I'd worked for newspapers uh, for a newspaper that covered the whole of the Darling Downs and the Marano. I'd spent a lot of time in much smaller places, and uh, so. So, you know, Ipswich was a substantial city. Also, a city very much on the move. It was when, um, dare I say, Paul, Paul Basali started uh, promoting himself as Mr. Ipswich and for better or worse, and, you know, what we know in hindsight was that maybe uh, things weren't as they appeared, but certainly Ipswich had lost, was losing that sort of stigma. It was transitioning. We were still doing stories about the abattoir and the coal mining and that sort of thing, but it was moving on. There were new industries, there, were new, there was a, you know, a, a, a sort of a the growth of a uh, hospitality scene, whatever. Uh, the, they tried to get the CBD up and up and happening. Uh, that's been a <laughs> yeah, ongoing yes. well, that problem, was, hasn't it? Uh, you, yeah. Were you here? No, you were you here for the fire or not? The Reeds fire? No, that was while you were away. That was yeah, about, that was yeah, about eighty five. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you would have come back to see Kern Corporation, as it was known, redeveloping mm. Nicholas Street, etc. And now we're just about to the end of the the latest twelve or thirteen years of of redevelopment. Who were the movers and shakers? You mentioned Paul Tully. Who were the other movers yeah, well, and Paul shakers? Paul Tully is, a, you know, is a, um, John Nugent, I think, was... Um, when did he become mayor? Uh, John was still uh, chair of Morton Shire back in That's the right. 80s. That's right, Morton, Morton Shire. But he became yeah. the first mayor of Ipswich in amalgamation in 95. Yeah, um, things were a lot different back in the, in the early 80s. I mean, partly because Ipswich was much smaller geographically than it is now. We had the uh, the Morton Shire, not to be confused with the current Morton, <laughs> uh, where uh, John Eugen, who went on to become uh, become the uh, the first uh, mayor of the combined Ipswich. But also we had um, the other shires, and for a while there, I was covering the council meetings in Gatton, in Laidley, in uh, in Boona, in Esk, uh, and and uh, g- going along as a very young guy, 21, 22. Uh, watching the machinations of local government uh, at close at close quarters. That was that was my round, and I did the show round too. I went to all the shows, which was uh, all the country shows, and I had to write uh, a news piece and a colour piece about each one. And you know, again, they were seen through the lens of somebody had grown up going to the Ecker, who's suddenly at the uh, at the Laidley show with. I don't know if she was a senator then, but Lady uh, Bielke Peterson, Pro Bielke Peterson, we ran, went around. Uh, actually, it was the Gatton show. I, I remember that quite clearly because she was uh, she was lovely. She was so so good and so much switched on to what they were doing. And we were w- walking around. I was sort of interviewing her as she was doing exhibits and whatever. And uh, she knew a, she had a lot of agricultural knowledge, obviously, because she she run the family farm. But she also knew how to play to the audience, and she said, "Oh, they've got me here, viewing the agricultural equipment." But you know, really, I probably should be judging the pumpkin spawn competition. <laughs> uh, and and that was one of the first occasions. And another one was when I met Russ Hins when he was the minister for everything at at uh, Gatton Police Station, seeing politicians work at close quarters, which of course, if, when you're covering politics in Brisbane, you're seeing them in Parliament. You're seeing one word as one side of them, but seeing them actually work the electorate is uh, is is a thing. Let's move to your stint at the Sunday Mail, being arts and entertainment editor. It sounds like a dream gig. Free tickets to more shows that you could possibly see. Yeah, well, I think you put your finger on it. There are more shows than you could possibly see, and it's something that I'd done at the Daily Sun too. I think my record was nine nights out in a row, while still doing the day job. 
going to the theatre, going to film. I had this crazy policy of at least once going to every theatre company, including all the amateur ones, and seeing what they were doing. So, yeah, it does sound like a dream. And there are, there are amazing stories of celebrity encounters, interviews that I've done, that sort of thing. But there, there were also a lot of very ordinary shows <laughs> uh, done by, by um, enthusiastic amateurs. Mm. Anything that seems like it's a dream job, yeah, it sounds after a while. I look at some people uh, who've done it, say, like Angela Bishop on Channel 10, who I've run into on occasions, who's been doing it for 30 or 40 years, and I go, how could you? I couldn't go back to doing it now. I mean, I, I, I'm i going out, you know, three to four nights a week to not wanting to go out at all. <laughs> I, I appreciate that at that time I was somebody that other people were relying on to help them make the choice. So I was getting the free, trick at, uh, free tickets and drinking the champagne at the opening night party or whatever, but I did have a responsibility to say to people, and I was never a real nasty reviewer but i think i tried to make it clear that it if something wasn't for you you know so so you can tell people what what it isn't by telling them what it is uh, and and i think that's the way i operated and i hope that people think that i that i did help them spend their discretionary money wisely uh, by putting them in the direction and you know i claim a few discoveries i i i claim having discovered deborah malm and i claim having dis- discovered kate miller heike I claim having discovered Naomi Price. They may see it differently. The extent of local talent coming from, well, not just Brisbane, but the southeast uh, is extraordinary, and I always wanted to celebrate that. Yeah. I think what I tried to do, whether I was in Ipswich or, you know, I wrote about a woman who who, who wrote poems, uh, and she was never going to be, certain wasn't going to be Shakespeare, wasn't even going to be Pam Ayers, but to me, that was a nice story because it was somebody doing something, following their dream. And uh, that's, I guess, what I took out of Ipswich is working at that local level where you, you, you're dealing with that. You know, we had the, um, the second time I was there, we had the fires uh, the, from the old gas uh, leaks from the coal mines that still hadn't been put out after decades. Yes. We actually played, through the QT, actually played a role in getting Peter Beatty, as it was then, to do something about that. You know, so there are, there are, there are successes as well, little achievements that you can make, which is the, the joy of journalism, not just celebrity journalism, but just making making a small difference to people. I'm not going to change the world, but I might be able to change someone's little, little part of it or helping someone gain a benefit that they need or bring, bringing attention to it. I did a big series back in the early 80s on teen pregnancy, which was, had been an issue and spoke to people about family planning. And, you know, th- these were quite bold things to do back in, in the early 80s, talk about these about these issues, you know, about yeah. young people having sex, you know. <laughs> oh, not that Talking word. <laughs> yeah. You also wrote recently lamenting the loss of coverage of the arts and the progressive takeover of sport in what remains of print editions of papers, and there's not many of them left. Uh, you had some interesting stats there, quite quite surprising stats. Well, I mean, it, it occurred to me, I was looking through an edition of the Courier Mail, on, and it was a Thursday edition. Thursday used to be the big day for entertainment. And back when there were competing daily papers, on Thursday we would have entertainment liftouts that had the movie reviews, that had the big celebrity interviews, had uh, interviews with uh, with bands and uh, local theatre reviews. We had the whole deal there, and there was one page which is which News Corporation now networks. They have just the one film reviewer. That was it, and then there was something like twenty four pages of sport. And I, I've had this discussion with people before. And if you look at the stats, the actual stats, cultural arts and culture events are much more popular than sport events in terms of personal attendance. Oh, here's an example: stage musicals. Stage musical, uh, two thousand seats, seven times a week for months on end. A big one, like at the moment, something like Wicked, which is coming for a second helping. Mm. Uh, and they're all mostly, apart from the real fans, different people. 
So every week you're getting you're getting, you're getting about um, fifteen thousand people again and again and again. Something like back in the day, found them the opera ran for six months uh, after already being in Melbourne for a couple of years and. And they go, oh, yeah, but 50,000 go to the football. Yeah, 50,000 go to the football for a big game, and they only, they're the same people. They will be the same 50,000 people will go next time. And then someone said to me, ah, yes, but football's very big on television. I go, what's on television when sport isn't on? Sitcoms, dramas? They'd be the arts, really, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Under the category. Yes. And then you can't, every way you slice and dice it, arts and entertainment, is is a big deal, and yet the media, the, the as you say, the dying newspapers are supposed to be reflecting our interests. And, you know, in many respects, they're reflecting a corporate interest that News Corporation has in rugby league, and in particular with the Broncos. Controversial statement there, but it's yeah. true. Yep. Um, because I know fans of, of other of other teams, the Dolphins, say we can't get a we can't get a look in. You know, um, I mean, it's nice now that women's sport is getting some attention. I'm very much in favour of that. But it's still about balance. Because what's the most popular uh, participatory sport? I think you'll find it's netball. Um, yeah. You know, and True. Uh, why is it, you know, that, that, we, that we're so enamoured with sport? Or that newspapers, the media is so enamoured with sport when they're not so enamoured with the other things that are going on? in particular the, the cultural things, the things that are the building blocks of who we are. So it's all out of balance and it just seems that sport gets a lot more attention than it deserves. And as I say, the stats back me up. But you can't have this argument. I had tried to have a discussion with Peter Dick on Radio 4 BC many years ago and I put that audio up online just recently and he was having none of it. And, I, you know, and, and I know Peter and I know that he was trying to make good radio by, by countering everything I said. Yeah. But when your argument is, oh, but people like sport, which is basically what it, what it is again. Yes, but people also like musical theatre. Why are we not writing about uh, Anthony Warlow, Marina Pryor or uh, other people in the same hushed and hallowed tones as we're talking about Wally Lewis or we're talking about... Today's contemporaries, uh, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, mm. who all these people are. You know, yeah. I don't even know who <laughs> a lot of the great sports people are. Uh, and that makes me a bit weird, I know, yeah. but it just it just seems strange to me that uh, the arts culture don't get a go, you know, that it's not exciting or interesting that people go to museums and art galleries and what is, what's the first thing you do when you're a tourist? You, know, you go to Rome, you have a cultural experience. You certainly do. Well, segue to overseas, that's a good cue. Uh, you mentioned before you went to Thailand and Abu Dhabi, um, among other places. Was it much of a culture shock when you first landed? I guess it was the first time when I had hardly travelled overseas at all um, that I went to work in the UK, which I think I, I left out of my shopping list of <laughs> adventures. Uh, but if you're going to go and work in a foreign country, I guess England's a good place to start if you're Australian, yes. particularly an Australian journalist, because there's a grand tradition of Australian journalists going to the UK. More of a shock, but even Hong Kong, because Hong Kong was still just in the dying days of empire, was still a British territory when I went there. So it was more so when I went to Shanghai, which was the culture shock, and to Bangkok, and, and then later to the UAE, by which time you learn quickly that you don't know everything, that your way is not the best way, or the only, certainly not the only way and not necessarily the best way, and you, you can't teach people to do it your way just because that makes you more comfortable. You've got to learn, you know, you've got to understand the place and, and your part in it. And I think a lot of Australians go overseas uh, thinking, well, I come from the best country in the world, so, you know, everything should be the way that it is here. And that's, you know, you're bound, well, you're bound at least to be disappointed, but you're also, you know, putting yourself probably in, in some uh, some danger by uh, extolling that opinion yes, in some place. Yes, some mortal danger. What about <laughs> censorship? You know, being a journalist in some of those countries, you'd have to be careful, I'm sure. Well, you, you have to be, but again, yes, you do. And people say, how could you work for the Communist Party in China? You know, I could turn around and say, well, how could you work for Rupert Murdoch? Um, because there are things you don't write. And there are things that this, as we speak, that people who work for News Corporation or for, for 
Channel 9 or for anyone else that they don't write because there's a corporate interest in them not they're not writing or broadcasting it. There, there are rules to, that, that, that to be obeyed and there are, you know, people who don't get talked about or people who only get talked about in, in hushed and hallowed tones. So to me, the integrity is in how you, how you navigate through that. Yeah. Uh, same in the UAE. The company was essentially owned by the UAE government and, uh, and there, were, there were things, I guess, that you didn't say, but then you, you have to look at it from the point of view, yes, but we're also getting news out there that otherwise would not be out there. And occasionally some of my colleagues walk, walked the fine line and fought the fight to say, well, I think we should cover this particular story. And there's one in particular was a little bit before my time that they were very brave in doing so. Not that many years ago, you worked at 4BC with Spencer Housen, very high profile and well-known personality, producing the show when it was on 4BC. Uh, that would have been a lot of fun with Spencer. And more recent events, you're predicting that he might be on the radar again for radio somewhere. He and I are friends, and we became friends when I, I used to do spots on his show when he was on the ABC. And when I did go overseas, some of you know, not regularly, but occasionally I would – dial in from, well, once from Minsk in Belarus, once from um, Edinburgh in Scotland, once I think from Birmingham, and other times from Bangkok. Yeah, so we we had this relationship. I came back for a a family reason, and I was at a loose end, and I was thinking of going back overseas, and uh, he said to me, I've just been offered this gig, and they said, "You you can suggest a producer, I want to suggest you. And I said, you know, I haven't actually produced a radio show before. He said, oh, you've got the skills and, you know, and we, and we will get along. And, and so we did and I did it and I'm glad I did. And I many ways wish that I was still doing that. And also very much wish that I'd done it earlier because producing radio is, is you know, is, is up there with the, the funnest things that you can do in life. You know, you, you're doing it all the time. I mean, when, you, when you're working as a print journalist, you can write something and you put it out there and then maybe you get some reaction to it. But when you, you're doing, doing talk radio, it's it's the it's the, it's walking the, the tightrope because you've got to simultaneously be listening to what the announcer is saying while you're fielding phone calls and you're making phone calls. You're rushing out to the green room to get some talent lined up. You're doing all those things. Uh, and it all unfolds in real time. It's, it's terribly exciting. Things you've predicted, uh, Brett. Uh, one I love that you predicted years ago, you were talking into the future about this digital domain, the internet, and you were talking about the demise of CDs and DVD rentals when they were at their peak. What made yes. you predict that one back then? Because that was a pretty oh, big prediction. Yeah, well, I, I had been an early adopter of the internet. In fact, I was on something, and I can't remember what it was originally called. I think at one stage maybe Telstra offered uh, a, a text-based service that I think might have been called Discovery at one point. Viatel. Anyway, it was just – sorry? I think it was called Viatel. It may well – that may, may mm. well be it too, yes. <laughs> and so I was on that, and, you know, it was just – it was like um, – the telex machine. Yes. <laughs> I had seen a demonstration of, um, no, I think, was it 7Tel, their, their text yes. service, which was a, a, a technology that used the, the bits of the TV screen that, that, that the broadcast didn't use to put text on screen. And I was interested to read that CFAX, which was uh, quite a popular version of that in the UK, was 50 years ago. So these things were floating around. And I had little web pages and email addresses and things, and, and I thought, this has got to be the future because you can talk to so many people, you can do it direct. So, yeah, and probably the ability to rip songs, the MP3s from uh, CDs had just sort of come around, and I thought, well, everyone will be doing this yes. soon. And it took a while, and then I thought, you know, we don't need a physical CD. We don't need something that we have to carry around and we have to be very careful with, uh, even though they claimed they were indestructible, which they weren't. Um, <laughs> but uh, because all that can be reduced to, well, back then, even there, maybe a USB stick, and that it just made a much more sensible idea to be able to carry around a 1,000 songs in your pocket than, than 10 songs on a fragile disc. But, of course, the rot was that they were getting you to buy the music that you already owned. 
with the broadcast, uh, with music, can happen with voice. We're seeing the rise of podcasts, like, you know, 400 episodes down the track for you and, you know, others doing amazing things. What you can do in the home office now is, is, is quite unbelievable. You take it for granted, but when I think back, and I need an excuse to play another jingle, Brett, when I think back to working at 4VK in 1978 and 79, it was nothing digital there at all, not a computer in sight, or the desktop PC was still to come, but you know everything, vinyl records, 45s, if you needed to have a pit stop, you had to make sure the song was at least four minutes and 30 seconds, and there weren't very many of them. <laughs> So, American pie, eight minutes. Uh, yeah, well, you had to drag that out uh, occasionally. Uh, so just just in honour of the great 4BK back then, it uh, was run by David Greenwood. He was the GM. Graham Kemp was the program director, and he was responsible for getting people like Wayne Roberts, Ray McGregor, David Kidd, Richard Perno was on the radio. I was, I was just the young one doing Midnight to Dawns. But it did make us all feel good. <laughs> If you listen closely, that was complete with a very short audio dropout because I took that off a VHS tape. <laughs> another another relic of the past. Exactly. <laughs> well, look, um, our, we're rambling on. We're, we're about that. Sorry, is that um, how long that was? They wouldn't play a jingle. They, you know, they, now it's just very sad. Very just, short. You know, well, that was made. Yeah, that was made for the sixty-second TV ad which featured all the daytime personalities in a band. You know, uh-huh. Somebody was faking playing a guitar, someone the drums, and, uh, yeah, they, were, they had a lot of fun making that ad. Brett, we're running out of time. How about some new predictions? I'll just hit you with three, all right? When will the Courier-Mail stop printing papers? Uh, when Rupert Murdoch dies. Um well, or, or before, because uh, the theory in News Corp is that Rupert will not pass away. Um, but <laughs> a lot of things will change when he does, uh, and he obviously is aware of his own mortality because at the moment he's fighting the family over the succession, mm. this is, which is a case of life imitating art imitating life. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, uh, it will... We've already seen, and, and again this week, there's a whole bunch of community newspapers and rural newspapers under the ACM banner, which is the former rural press. They've all been closing. Uh, we've seen with the QT, uh, well, you know, they're the, they, it's, they it's a ghost paper now. It's a ghost paper. There's nobody here writing stories. No, that's that that's true, and that's very very sad. And it's not because there's no there are not stories to be told. There are more stories than ever to be told. There's local media like yourself. There's a couple of papers up there that people are doing. I hope they're doing well. They they deserve to. But the problem is the print itself will die out. One of the things that, that Murdoch did of course was uh, dismantle all the presses very quickly too. So the, the means for other people to print newspapers aren't really there in, in any great volume either. No, um, that, that is true. Yeah. There's I think there's one major printing press in Rockhampton which is now owned by the Today News Group. So they're doing a lot of printing there for themselves and, and others. Uh, okay, prediction number two. Can 4BC sort out its identity crisis? I really hope so. I mean, I've got, not just because I used to work there, but also because, as I said earlier, it's the station that my dad used to listen to. I'm very fond of 4BC. I just don't think that the current management based in Sydney don't understand the Brisbane market. They're trying to replicate the success that they've had with 2GB and 3AW. They are applying the same rules or the same rules don't don't apply here. They made a bad call that they brought in uh, a classic hits breakfast show 
but then continued with the talk radio format during the day. Um, that's uh, what they do then. And also who, I don't, I think maybe the era of shock jock, talk shock jockery is, well, not only not, you know, ended, I think it's, it's sort of passed us by altogether. It's just never really been a thing in this part of the world. I fear that, uh, that they will either go back to just networking because they missed their opportunity to change format, which is not, you know, which 4BC has been many times over, it's, as all radio stations have. They missed that opportunity because 4BH did it. Mm. And 4BH, 4BH uh, picked up the, the uh, when 4KQ closed, they picked up the, the, the music format and they picked up uh, Bob Gallagher, who, 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 who was part of the 4KQ success story back in the day in 97.3. A known quantity put him in breakfast. Uh, the rest of it comes from somewhere else, but the music uh, they've got they've got the whole the whole package, which BBC wasn't prepared to commit to. No. And I think the great tragedy is that BBC does go back to just being a network version of 2GB. It won't be any fault of the good people who are working there now. It'll be some bad decisions that were made elsewhere. That'll be unfortunate. Okay, last one, and it's a big one. Who will win the state election? I think the LNP will win. I think David Christopher will be the next um, will be the next premier. I don't know that he's necessarily done the work to deserve that. I think his strongest uh, suit is that he's not the, any of the people who've been running the show for the past twelve years. Uh, the incumbency has affected them. But I also think that what this whole process has brought forward some great ideas, including which he's committed to continuing, the 50 cent uh, public transport uh, fare, which I think is a brilliant, uh, brilliant initiative. I think public transport actually should be free and uh, uh, that, that, that that's the future. So I think maybe, and, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a landslide, but I also wouldn't be surprised if it was very tight and that the, the Greens played a role in, uh, in anointing the next... Uh, the next premier. That'll be uh, very interesting in those uh, inner Brisbane seats, that's for sure. Brad Debritz, this has been uh, so much fun. Uh, as I said at the start, lots of self-indulgence. So I hope uh, our listeners also shared with our self-indulgence and enjoyed it. Appreciate your, your generous amount of time today. Thank you for speaking with Ipswich today. Well, thank you. And that is it for episode 400. Look for handy links in the show notes, including to Brett's blog, Mr Brisbane. Ipswich Today is supported by Kinetics, people-powered web hosting trusted by Australian businesses since 1999. This podcast is listener supported. Please make a once only gift or regular donation to help keep it online. Just go to ipswichtoday.com.au. Follow and stream this podcast from your favourite app, including iHeartRadio, or play Ipswich Today on smart speakers. Music is supplied by Purple Planet Music. This is Alan Roebuck. Thank you for listening. Enjoying Ipswich today? Please share the love on your socials.